Didn't the other kids tell you not to come here? Go back, 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 go back. At the heart of horror, there has always been more than spooks and scares. Sometimes, it's not what you see, but what you hear. Welcome to Sound Scary. Each week, we talk to the artists, the musicians, the fans, the people who haunt the shadowy corners of your mind. Join us as we delve into the deepest, darkest, and most unforgettable earscapes. Welcome to Sound Scary. Welcome to a special holiday episode of Sound Scary. Uh, I am your host, Ryan Coltrera, and today we are excited, really excited, to welcome a director of a movie that I absolutely loved. But first, I'm going to toss it over to my co-host. Well, not only is he a, 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 this is a great movie, this new film that he has, but he's just a great director. He's found this beautiful balance of action and horror in all his mm-hmm. stuff. Tommy Workola, thank you for joining us at Sound Scary and... Thank you for making my new favorite Christmas movie, Violent Night. <laughs> <laughs> I've well, got to that's... say, how did this script come to you? And what was your reaction with basically, you know, a kind of a revamp of Die Hard with Santi? Um, well, it came to me through 87 North, which is Dave Leach and Kelly McCormick and also Guy Danella, who just started working there. And I worked for either work with or known them for a long time, each and every one of them in, in different ways. And 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 Leash actually did second unit on Hansel and Gretel before he became one of the biggest directors in the world. Uh, so we became friends. Um, and I, they had obviously started a deal at Universal and done nobody there. And um, they had just seen my last film before this called the, in English, it was called The Trip um, that I did that Netflix bought um, worldwide except Norway where it got a theatrical so they had just seen that and uh, and thought it was great and and sent me the script for Violet Night and they said what you said basically yeah it's like Die Hard but with Santa Claus <laughs> and and I was like oh, okay that could uh, that could be cool but it could also be you know a one note kind of gimmick um, but when I read the script I really felt yes it was that obviously but it also had a lot of heart and it felt like a Christmas movie, which I loved. That was that was my way in. That was what I latched onto. It's like, okay, that's this is really appealing to me. I can actually do all this crazy stuff, uh, but also make a Christmas movie. And one of the things that I, I loved about this film is that somehow you managed to walk this line between like crazy violence and action and genuine Christmas cheer. Like, what was your approach to finding that balance? Um, well, I do, I always love mixing tones and genres and, and, and trying to, what, no matter what I do, I always try to have my sense of humor in there. And, 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 and that was, I knew that for sure. I wanted that. And I want to have that, uh, just the coziness of Christmas movies and the message and the heart and all that stuff mixed with, with, with hardcore action and gore and, and dark humor. But I, when I read the script, I, I, I said to the producers, like, I think if we can get the relationship between Santa and the little girl truly right. If we can make that the kind of the emotional anchor through the fi- in the film and kind of weave it throughout the, the story, uh, if we get that right, we can do whatever we want. We can go as crazy as we want, but that's our core. That's what we should really focus on. I know, because I knew we could we could kill with the action and the humor and the gore. That's that's not, not going to be a problem. But that was the big thing to, to really sell that relationship and to really make that sweet and special despite all the carnage and the craziness. So that was a, a lot of the focus going into it. Speaking of that, the, that little girl is fantastic. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it, it really is. You, you, you did it. You accomplished that because you do care. You really like her. How did, how did you go about finding her? What was the casting process like? It was just, it was like with, when you, when you cast children, it's, it's a lot, it's a big process and you obviously read a lot of people. Um, and I, uh, we, 
saw hundreds of tapes. Um, and then I came across Leia's tape, Leia Brady. And this is a kind of a first, I wonder if she's done a commercial before something like that, but this is her first feature, first real role. And she has a twin sister uh, and <laughs> who's also an actress. And they both uh, like, so I think we saw both of them and I, we ended up on Leia. Uh, but I wonder if this, I think the sister's already done some work. Um, but yeah, no, Leia did an amazing job. Um, I Skyped with her after I saw her tape and I talked to her and did like a live read and she really nailed it. And she understood the humor most of all. Like, that was the key thing. I really think she got... She knew how to deliver those lines to make it funny. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was a trick. Uh, <clears throat> we had a lot of great actors coming in and reading for it, but she was the one that really got, I mean, the heart, but the humor as well. So right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing this movie a couple times with an audience and it's, it's a real crowd pleaser. And both times people were just going absolutely nuts for certain parts of your movie. Were, was there a moment when you were directing this that you were really hoping would land with the crowd that did exactly that when you saw it? <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's a few moments that I felt like if we, like, for example, when I got the script, the, the Home Alone scene was there, but it wasn't mm -hmm. as big. It was kind of small. Um, and I that, uh, that was one of my first things. I, I really think this could be the showstopper of the movie, or one of them at least. And so we really elaborated on that and made it bigger and more... Uh, gross and violent and funny <laughs> um, and so yeah that was to see that with a crowd and it probably gets the biggest reaction just just noise wise um, especially <laughs> when he falls on the nail and uh, that, that was really fun to shoot and try to come up with the rhythm of it and the humor and, and basically like it is a home alone you know we haven't done mm -hmm. the traps are not that um, elaborate or uh, gore, like we, we haven't uh, added things to the trap. We really just took some basic traps that we've seen in the movies and all right, this is what really would happen. Um, <laughs> and that was obviously a lot of fun with that. But I think that the most surprising bits seeing with an audience is the laughs you didn't expect. Like you, you, you kind of see it in the script. Oh, this is kind of funny. Oh yeah, this kind of, this is cute. Uh, but it gets a big reaction in the crowd. And obviously a lot of that also is, has to do with the actors, just how they sell it and how funny they are and how the, like Harbor had a, Harbor really wanted to, to play Santa. And I, we agree. This was the first thing we talked about when we talked, like we can't try to, he should never try to be funny. Like he should play it so serious and so down to earth and so grounded. And that's where the humor comes from. And we really spent a lot of time finessing that and, how much of him do we reveal at the different fights and throughout the film and throughout the story? And, and when do we get to the action hero? We really try to delay that as long as possible and play the fumbling, bumbling, clumsy Santa as long as we could. Um, and Harvard had a lot of fun doing that and also just playing it. This is this poor guy getting sucked into this horrible storyline. But yeah, you know, it was a, those jokes and those gags that I didn't see coming are always the, my favorite ones. Like there's one moment I remember in the, um, uh, in, it, was, it wasn't even a big moment in the script. It was uh, after Santa has fallen out the window and Scrooge and um, his uh, henchmen watch the videos of what happened. And they say, yeah, we got a Santa running around here. And he looks at the monitors and this is this weird shot of Santa hobbling, limping across the, the, the mansion. And it's just got a huge laugh every time. And I think it's just, again, like how Harbor did it and how pathetic he made Santa look at that moment um but yeah so there, there was a but it, it was such a we, we didn't test it that many times we only tested it twice to kind of the second time just to fine-tune and so when we screened it for the first time in New York uh, at Comic-Con for a thousand people that four thousand people sorry that was a that was a great experience and a big relief just oh okay uh, they got it <laughs> I'm glad you brought up Harbor who is just He's blown up. I mean, I remember seeing him. I, I think uh, the first thing I really remembered him was from A Walk Among the Tombstones, which was such a, a powerful performance. Uh, he's brilliant in this. And there's so many layers to this character because you you hear the idea. Yeah, Santa Claus Die Hard. It, like you said earlier, it could have been terrible. It could have been ridiculous. But my God, he brings humanity to this guy. How how in depth did you work with him, and and how easily was did how much of it is just him being great, <laughs> honestly? <laughs> well, there's uh, obviously he's a he's a great actor, and 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 
I remember the first time we had a casting call and we got, you know, when you do those things, you get those lists from agencies and you start going through names. And at one of the first meetings we had, we hadn't gone on to anybody and somebody brought up David Harbour and we all just looked, looked at each other. It's like, yes, of course, he's so perfect for it. It's like, it was the obvious choice. Um, and we sent it to him that day and I Skyped with him two days later and he was on board. And I think he, you know, he just felt it and, and, and he was, just, he was, he was this character. It was so clear from the first moment we got that script. Um, but obviously he's a smart actor. He's very hands-on and he's got a lot of ideas. And like I said, one of the things we talked about a lot was to really make sure that in the beginning we meet this very classical Santa, like the Coca-Cola Santa with the perfect glasses and the white hair and like, and, and start peeling off layers. Like in the script, in the beginning, he, he became an action hero much sooner and he had a lot more one-liners and Har Harbour never liked the one-liners <laughs> as a lot of actors don't. Like it's, I, I get it. It's always, it's hard to sell those things sometimes and you feel awkward doing them, but wow. he did them all. And we knew marketing would use a lot, a lot of them, which they did. Um, but it was about, yeah, like not making him too cool and too badass and, and saving, saving that stuff from later and, and slowly revealing it and slowly peeling off the different layers through the fights, like to, he's kind of finding himself through the various fights. And of course, the little girl who's kind of awakening the, the Christmas spirit again in him and also reminding him of who he once was. But yeah, no, the, a lot of time it's just get out of the way and let Harbour do his thing. And like, there's this moment where, and it was like a quarter of a page in the script where he comes to the chimney the first time and he takes in the room and he just tastes the cookies and the booze and all that but he just made such a meal out of it i think the first cut of that scene was like three minutes just of him wandering around being goofy and trying different things and trying the massage chair and uh no he really he really nailed it and went for it and he, he, he had a lot of fun creating a, a a different type of santa because i'm sure and i didn't think about it until later that for any actor, it's it could be intimidating doing the role of Santa Claus. It's so many actors have done it in so many movies and so many genres. And so, you know, to find your own way in and to make him unique and stand out, uh, obviously a lot of that was in the script, but a lot of that came from him uh, and just the way he 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 found that character. And, and his performance was so fun in that movie. And and I I and to kind of piggyback on what you were talking about on kind of how throughout the film. You know, we kind of reveal more about him through his performance and we kind of peel back the layers from Coca-Cola Santa. I also just wanted to give props to the fact that, you know, I love how you used wardrobe in this movie to go from kind of the classic Santa look to something a little bit more ancient and haggard and really reveal character notes about him through his wardrobe as well as his performance. I just want to kind of tip my hat to that. Yeah, no, kudos to the to the team there. And, and Harbour has a lot of ideas there as well. And yeah, we like the fact that the, the 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 deepest layers are the ones that were kind of Viking, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. basically, uh, you know, what do you call it in English stuff here? Um, I, I can't, I don't know the English word, like the armor on the arms. Oh, uh, yeah. I <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It, is a, it is a word. You're on a like, blank too now. <laughs> um, but they, they come up pretty late you know, when he's stitching himself up. And obviously we reveal the tattoos at that point. And, and for the people that notice it, like his sleigh has, is actually the, the tip of a, a Viking ship with the uh, that. wagon in the front. Um, so there's all these, these hints there and, and, and layers to it. But yeah, it was, a, it was a fun thing coming up with, with the team and David. To, okay, how, how can we take our time with this? And, and I really think that was a key to making that character special. The fact that we didn't just go crazy straight away uh, and saved, saved the, um, the good stuff for later. Hmm. I want to talk a little bit about, continue on a little bit because the, the design here, the, the, how, how detailed you are and not in just, not with just the script, but the character design, the care, the clothing, everything. How, how particular are you as a filmmaker when it comes to film and how, how, no, we have to have this, right. We have to have this because, the, it seems like you have a reason for everything you put on screen. <laughs> well, I, I um, it's a good question. I mean, I don't, I don't think I am like uh, Fincher level when it comes to that. Like, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I, who's obviously a genius. Um, and and coming from Norway, having made movies there, like with no money and no time, you kind of learning to always compromise i uh, yes that's a thing as as a director always uh, but 
uh, in Norway, there's like, you gotta, like Dead Snow, the, the original script we had was so different than what we shot because we never had time and money or equipment to pull up what we wanted. So you kind of learn to go with the flow and compromise. Uh, but as you make more movies and have you have more time and, and bigger budgets, of course, you wanna have a chance to put that kind of detail in, in there. And, and personally, I, I do that a lot as a writer. I like to write, I like to go in there and, and work on the script and uh, myself and, 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 and put a lot of that stuff through my writing and 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 yes of course uh, like with with Santa like it was the pieces were all there because the writers had this uh, and it, it, this doesn't come from me is despite me being from Norway the Viking backstory was always there uh, we, we just elaborated on it but that was the key we needed to for Santa like every single bit of his fighting style his his kind of demeanor his his obviously his clothes the undergarments the tattoos all and the ship, the sleigh, all this Viking, all comes from different parts of the Viking era. And like, we, we just try to, for, it just comes all from the character and who he is. And, and that's the fun way of doing that, obviously. And yes, do I wish I had more time and money to, to really put an insane amount of detail on everything? Of course, like every filmmaker dreams of that. But this was still shot pretty efficiently. Like, I think we had 40 days, 41 days, wow. which is which is not much um, uh, for this size of the movie. So we had to move fast and efficiently and, and couldn't mess around too much. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, it is a luxury, obviously. And I, I, as a director, you kind of want that, of course, as much as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also used to not getting that every time. Uh, so hopefully that makes, um, uh, makes me a good collaborator. And, and, and again, like on this one, the, the production design, Roger Fear is, He's just an amazing guy and had so many ideas on how to utilize, like, again, I can, the time and money we had, it's not a Marvel movie. It's not the Fast and the Furious movies from, from the same studio. We just had to be really fast and efficient. So for example, we, we could only afford to build one floor of the mansion interior, hmm. all that's on stage. But we actually, and we also, because we had not much time, he designed it like you did the theaters in the old age. Like there's, every wall has, two sides uh, and so all the bedrooms we could flip um, turn them into a, the, from the first uh, floor bedroom to the second floor bedroom uh, the kitchen flipped to the man to the lounge like every room had two or three uses and the actual main room itself we flipped and used as the barn where Santa is surrounded and taken on by the mercenaries mm -hmm. um, so wow. yeah it, and that you know that's that's a lot of fun when you can pull off something like that and, and obviously we couldn't do that without roger and his ideas um but yeah so that was a long convoluted answer to your question i hope i got some of them there <laughs> it was that was lovely great answer. lovely answer so violent night focuses on more of a kind of classical western approach to santa claus and the holidays but i was wondering if there was any uniquely norwegian christmas traditions that you could tell us about that we should know about um norwegian christmas traditions there is actually one that I, they're making a movie about as we speak here in norway they're doing a, a horror comedy with martin star um uh, uh, uh the lead role called there's something in the barn and this is a, there's an urban legend <laughs> in the north um that every christmas eve you have to put out a, a, a plate of porridge for the it's called the Barn Santas, uh, <laughs> tiny, tiny little, there's several of them, like gremlins. They're like Santa's nice. gremlin type. And if you forget it, they'll be angry and, and they'll come for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so a lot of you, for kids, you just kind of scare them. You have to put out the porridge um, for the barn Santas. Um, and if, yeah, if you forget it, uh, they will be held to pay. But of course, the grown-ups just eat the porridge. And, uh, and, and that was, a, yeah, that was a, a thing that uh, for a long time we did. I remember putting that that plate of porridge out on the on the porch. Um, <laughs> and where I'm from, there's I mean I'm from the very very top like north of Norway. Um, and um, I shouldn't probably be saying this because it's a Santa movie with reindeers, but in in the north of Norway we eat a lot of reindeer. <laughs> um, oh no, <laughs> Christmas as well. So um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to. I think that's. That's about what I can think about that is uniquely Norwegian. Um, That's awesome. You know, I, I want to jump in really quickly, and you mentioned these guys, and I, you're you're working with literally 
in my opinion, some of the best stunt people, stunt work. These guys are incredible. I mean, how did you guys connect with 87? How how did that happen? Um, well, I get like we go way back, me and Dave, and I got to you know Kelly, obviously, and, and Guy Danella was an old friend who worked at Studio 8 before I did a lot of writing for them. Um, so when they sent me the script, it was an easy way in, and obviously. I know everybody knows what they do with action. And yeah. I think what makes them unique is their love for action. Like they truly love action and R-rated action, especially. Uh, and that, they have a soft spot for that. And they really want to try to make that a genre again. Um, and obviously when it comes to pulling off that action, they're unique. They have a fantastic team. And this one, it was led by Jojo Eusebio, who's done a lot of work with them. But he also like, he just came from, I think before us, he did the, um, the Obi Wan show, like he's one of the best there is, second unit guys and starting coordinators. Um, and yeah, it, it is a true pleasure working with them. I remember way back, like when we did Hans and Gretel, they kind of revolutionized the way of doing stunts and especially how to finesse those sequences and rehearse them and show them to you as a director. I remember, you know, like they, I don't know if you know this, but like when they have a scene from a script, like let's say that in our, in our instance, like let's do the, um, the game room fight, like the Frosty, when he fights the chef, the guy with the chef's costume. Um, so what they do then is they first get measurements of the entire set and all the props and, and like the, the pinball machine and everything. And they measure it up and then they go back to their gym and they recreate that whole room with cardboard. So what they do is like they make a cardboard Christmas tree, a cardboard shelf, a cardboard chair, table, everything. So the room is set exactly like it is uh, on, the, on our set. And then they... Obviously, at this point, they have a script. They also can have storyboards from me. And then they go at it and they do all that and they add their own ideas. And then they cut it and they even put music and sound and rough CGI effects on this thing. It's a very rough thing to get. But I remember seeing it for the first time in Hansen and Gretel. It's like, oh, shit, this is better my, than my earlier movies back in Norway. Um, they're so thorough. Like, and Obviously, when you see that, you can say, OK, I like this part. This part is probably a little too slow. Maybe you can add this idea here and there. And then they go back again and they reshoot it, recut it and show it until you're happy with it. Wow. And then you have a full video, fully edited of all the angle, everything you want is on that video, which makes it so easy for them to show the actors and show the camera people and everybody like, it just makes actually shooting that scene so much easier and efficient. And you're already done. I mean, obviously you can still have ideas like on the barn fight in, in, our, in this film where we, he takes on 25 mercenaries. We always got new ideas as we went along and let's try this, let's try that. But for most of the time, you, you're so prepared and you're so ready when you're going into it already. And the actor have seen the video and rehearsed it so many times. And also we cast, they have a lot of people in the team that are also good actors. So like the Frosty or uh, Tin Soldier, stunt performers and actors. So they can... They're in the mm. film. Obviously, they can also rehearse with David for all the fight scenes. So when we get on set, it just saves us so much time. And yeah, they're amazing. And they love, love action movies and R-rated action. And uh, yeah, couldn't have asked for, for better partners. No, they're artists. That's how they do yeah. it. Approach it. Mm -hmm. it's art, art, yeah. art. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, and just there, there are so many just gleefully violent moments in this movie that connected with me. But were there any that didn't make the final cut or didn't get filmed that uh, were just a little too much, maybe? You know what? I wish I could. I, no, there wasn't. And I that was one awesome. of the things that I loved. <laughs> that the studio just trust us. And they were so like, yeah, go for Hell it. Yeah. And I think they knew like, if this film is going to have a, a chance of, of, of breaking through, it, we, we just had to embrace what we were. And we were an already edgy, crazy action movie. And they knew that and they've been so supportive. And I, yeah, I, there was a few times where we sent in a rewrite or ideas like when that guy get, gets pulled into the snowblower and he's just, you know, like I, I was pretty sure the studio was going to come back say, maybe that's a little too much, but never, <laughs> never happened. Um, so it was a it was a joy, actually, to to kind of feel that support. I'm so well, happy they just let it ride. I got you know, well, Tommy, I think that says something, too, about your style. I mean, I mentioned this to you at the premiere you have a way of making it super violent, extremely violent in many ways, but it's fun. It doesn't feel like overbearing. It doesn't feel like it's beating you over the head, sometimes mm. literally. You know, yeah. there's some, there, and that, that takes a lot of skill, which I, I think you've shown countless times from Hansel and Gretel to obviously 
Dead Snow, which is, you know, both the films are, are two of the best horror films ever made, in my opinion. They're amazing. Thank you, thank you. No, You're welcome. Here. I I know uh, I know uh, Ryan had some dead snow questions. If you don't mind, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, of course, no. I, I would say though, like yes, I I I'm glad you're saying that, and obviously there's something I love and, and having humor and, and fun into that, and it it is honestly because of of two directors when I watched when I was very young. It was uh, Peter Jackson and Sam Raimi, and hmm. I, I remember that being an eye opener to me. I remember seeing Brain Dead for the first time, and just the amount of gore, but I me finding it so funny what was going on uh, it was just a combination I, I felt i'd never seen before and since then i've been obsessed with with the horror comedies or splatter movies whatever you call them like uh, there's obviously they're the masters when it came to combining humor and gore and action like that so yeah no i'm i'm, uh, I'm very happy with the on this one like on this one the goal was to combine the feel of a christmas movie with our humor and the and the the gorier parts and then hopefully made for an interesting combination <laughs> that's so funny my my next question was going to be uh would is brain dead and evil dead like two influences for you so scratch that question yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know and it really reads too like i i feel like the the kind of passion and the the early kind of peter jackson energy within you and it it absolutely shows yeah I agree. Dead Snow is one of my girlfriend's favorite movies. And so I, I asked her if there was anything that she wanted me to ask of you. And she actually wanted me to ask for your recommendation. She said, is there any Scandinavian horror movies that you feel deserve more American attention? Um, that, that was a good question. I'm trying to think what, what hasn't gotten attention. Yeah, there's a, there's a, I mean, I feel like the the best ones always kind of break through. There was a like when I was younger. Like we have to remember when I grew up in Norway, there was no genre movies ever. Mm. Like they didn't they get, didn't get made. We only made dramas or family movies here uh, for a long long time. And I remember when we did the snow. I think we were only the second horror movie in like four years to ever made. Like, it, it, but obviously the floodgates open after that. Um, but there was a few. There's a Danish one that I loved, um, but I uh, the English title I won't know, but it's called Nattevakten, the night. Uh, let's see. I'm going to Google it now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I'm gonna Google it live um, here. Uh, it doesn't say the uh, Night Watch, it was called. Okay. I, I oh, yeah. I yeah. wonder if it did have a name. Yeah, I, I remember loving that movie. Um, there was a couple of Dan the Danes had a few great horror movies back in the day that I watched and, and, and loved growing up. Um, uh, and Norwegian wise, you know, the, the, the horror movie that came right before the snow that kind of opened the doors, uh, even for us, was a movie called Vilmark, which I'm going to also do because I don't know the English name. Uh, I don't think that ever got a US distribution. Mm. Uh, No, no, it doesn't <laughs> I am to be no English title, but it was, uh, yeah, again, Wilmark, it was uh, one of the few, few uh, Norwegian horror movies ever made before it kind of uh, everybody started doing them. Um, so, but yeah, like I said, growing up, we had to kind of look overseas in the Hollywood, obviously, uh, but the Danes were earlier than us and Swedes. Um, but growing up, finding a Norwegian horror movie, uh, that wasn't possible. What was your what was the uh, horror, first horror film that you discovered that you're like oh holy shit this is what I love this? Um, there was so that you know there's there's quite a few because my older brother is ten years older than me, and he was a movie geek back in the day, uh, and he w brought home a lot of movies that I saw at a very young age that I shouldn't have seen. Um, so I was hooked <laughs> very early on, <laughs> very early. Um, but I'm yeah I, like I remember the first time I saw The Exorcist. Uh, again, I was super young, and I, it, that scarred me for life. Um, um, I'm trying to think. Like A Nightmare on Elm Street was a movie that was my favorite horror movie for a long, long time. Um, just mind blowing. And I, I think Wes Craven is such a fantastic director, and that's you know, like mm. everybody knows that. But he's really done like amazing work through different decades, and like reinvented the, the horror genre two or three times. Um, I like the, I, I just rewatched the people on the stairs, which is a movie that I hadn't seen since I was a kid, 
And I remember loving it back then. And I, it was still, it still held, held up so well. It was fantastic. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, a lot of the classic uh, uh, um, American ones, but I also like, like I just did a podcast a few weeks back with uh, Mick Garrett. Is that anything? Um, oh, yeah, nice. yeah. Love Mick. Yeah. Was, yeah. And again, he had made some of the movies that I, uh, you know, Critters 2. <laughs> I, I, I watched all that kind of stuff. Devoured that. I loved it when I was a kid. Uh, the Stand, his miniseries. Um, yeah, I, I saw everything. Uh, I, re- I truly did. Uh, and I also found, um, I had a trick at the local video store um, that I used to, to rent movies that were way above my rating, like I, that I shouldn't be able to. And I, uh, because I knew that the people working there often didn't know that much about movies, or some of them at least didn't do it. Um, so I used to go up there and I said, by the way, do you have... Um, can you check on your computer, on your system, if you have uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2? Yeah. It's like, yeah, sure, I can check it. Yeah, it's in. It's a, and I just said, okay, can I just run it with a, I don't need to find the cover. Can you just use one of those blank ones you got behind the counter? And yeah, sure, that's fine. And they, because that, <laughs> when they could check the rating on the back of the VHS cover. <laughs> and they just gave it to me. So I, I did that a lot. That was my trick to rent gruesome horror movies that I watched at a very young age. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, well played. Uh, throughout the film, you know, I noticed a lot of references to classic Christmas movies. Obviously, you have your Die Hard, you have your Christmas Vacation, Beverly D'Angelo. I know I, I'm trying to remember specifics. There were a couple hidden in the attic sequence that I noticed. Um, were there any that you hid in there that you think people have not picked up on yet? Well, I mean, there's one, and I, but I, the reason I kind of mention it now because is the production center did it. He did a tweet or Instagram about it the other day, but like the um, uh, the wrapping paper, all the presents that Santa pulls out of his sack, mm-hmm. is the exact same classical wrapping paper on uh, the Polar Express, all the gifts there. Like he, uh-huh. he was so good at just finding all these movies, all everything at Christmas movies and Christmas history, and like, and he tried to anchor it in something we've seen before or felt before or known from somewhere else. And he, yeah, like the attic you mentioned, and there's a. Like the, the catering truck, I'm not going to say what it says, but like the catering truck has a name that references another Christmas. Like he was just so good at placing all these tiny, tiny little hints uh, everywhere um, to really just, again, like don't hit, not hit you over the head with it, but just have a f- like fun little tributes here and there to uh, what came before us. I love that. It, it warrants rewatching and you just, it's fun to notice new details every time we rediscover the film. Uh, and I, I you know it's obviously your film's in the news right now because it's being released. Uh, you can now rent it, stream it. I although I'm going to say right here, right now, because we are going to do this episode real early, man. Please go see it in theaters. It's just this is the kind of movie you need to see with an audience on the big screen. I mean, obviously the I I'm going to compliment you a little bit, Tommy, in the sense that. I've seen a lot of movies this year. I think this is probably the most fun I've had sitting in a movie. It's, it is a joy. It's a joy. Mm. It's going to be in my top ten. It's uh, it's one of those films that just resonated, and I think that kudos, man, you've made a Christmas classic. <laughs> well, well, thank you so much. I mean, it's super super nice to hear, and, and and yes, it's it was fun seeing it with a crowd. You really felt the energy and people enjoying it together. Um, and yes, as, as the other stuff, like, yeah, when we made it and when we met on it the first time, obviously our dream was to make something that people could rewatch later on and, and next year, mm-hmm. next year, hopefully after the kids have gone to bed. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was a dream. I mean, and hopefully, hopefully this is a movie that can be enjoyed uh, many Christmases from now on. Mm, I agree. Oh, abs- absolutely going on my Christmas rotation. I mean, so, I mean, throughout the film, there's a lot of really fun use of, you know, Christmas needle drops and music, you know, to kind of highlight the juxtaposition of violence and kind of fun, innocent music. So kind of a softball question. I wanted to ask, what is your favorite Christmas song? My favorite Christmas song is actually in the end credits. It's Slade, Merry Christmas. Mm. Oh, so, nice. I love Slay when I growing, growing up. Um, again, my older brother uh, had all their LPs and I listened to them a lot. Um, so I was thrilled when we got permission to use that one. Um, and another one that I listened to a lot when I was a kid, because it, every year uh, in our like top 10 radio show, it got voted for the top every Christmas. Uh, 
was um, Brian Adams' uh, Christmas time. Mm. And so to use that in the in the in that whole barn sequence, um, I was really happy to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, no, Slade is is my favorite Christmas song. I would say that. Yeah, that's a great song. I, I I first of all, I want to thank you. Like you've been spending so much time with us, and I don't. I know you probably have t- things to do, so I don't want to keep you yeah. too much. Longer. Um, but I really, it's man, this is a great movie, and I, I guess my one final question from my my part is like. You've done the sequel. You did one of the best sequels, to be honest. Dead Snow 2 is fantastic. Um, do you think about that? Is that coming through your head, going through your head with the success? of Because it, it did pretty well. This is a pretty, people love this movie. Do you think there's a sequel? Do you think you would ever go for that? Is that even a conversation? I mean, we have kind of, we have this loosely discussed the idea of it and, and if people embrace it and uh, we would, I think all of us, me, David, producers, uh, writers, I think we would love to go in there again and, and, and uh, tell another story. I mean, there's so much we haven't explored yet. We haven't seen the North Pole. We haven't seen the elves. We haven't seen Mrs. Claus. And we also have some ideas we had to cut just for time and money last time around. And, mm. and we also have discussed loosely a couple of ideas for a possible sequel. But I guess we'll still see, you know, how it plays to Christmas and how it's doing on, on, on pay-per-view and all that stuff. But it's feeling good. And, and. Yeah, and hopefully it's something uh, we can go back to. I would love to tell another story in this world, for sure. Mm-hmm. And we would love to see it. Yeah. And Brian, why don't finish this off? Yeah. <laughs> All right. My, my final question to you before we wrap up. Did you th- do you think you made the nice list or the naughty list this year? <sighs> I, I think I'm pretty. I think it's nice. I think nice. I mean, yeah. I would say nice this year. I've been a good boy this year. I've been working so much. I haven't been time to do anything wrong. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. I'd agree. I mean, it's you're 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 an absolute legend. I, I I loved meeting you back when we moderated Dead Snow too. I, you're just it's always a pleasure to talk to you. You're one of the nicest. You are nice. You're one of the nicest guys in the world. So I appreciate you stopping by. <laughs> we so really much. appreciate this. No, it, it was a pleasure, and um, no, thank you guys for all the kind words. Hmm. anytime man anytime it's, and please come back we'd love to have you back on anytime you have anything to promote we you're always welcome here absolutely great, no, appreciate it it's been great talking to you thank you so much for taking the time all right well thank you guys and have a happy holiday all that stuff thank happy you holiday. happy holidays thank you Bye, Bye. Bye.